My fellow daydreamers, today it's just you and me. I'm going to share a few things and then we're going to get the hell out of here. So put the phone back in your pocket. Creating behavior starts now. My fellow daydreamers, we are in what I believe to be the longest fucking month of the year. It feels that way. I don't know about you guys, but August sometimes feels like a, a seven-week month. You know, it's that, that odd time, you know, we're, we're waiting for September. We're counting down the days for Labor Day weekend, and going into the fall. And I don't know, I, I find myself always... Uh, challenged by August and particularly now because you know I should be on vacation I should be recovering and rehabilitating myself from a year of teaching and that can't happen because the whole schedule got thrown out of whack and I'm teaching through the end of August so rather than my usual six weeks off to myself I, I have two coming up and so I don't really know how I'm going to handle that I don't know what condition I'm going to be in come mid-September but right now, uh, I'm not looking forward to it. And I guess what I would share with you about that is, you know, there are going to be times, stretches in your, in your life, certainly artistically, where you don't feel like doing anything creative. You don't feel like an actor. You don't want to pick up that play and read it. You don't want to work on the business shit that you've got to do. And it can do a number on you because you start thinking to yourself, well, maybe I'm not really an artist. Maybe I really don't care. And I guess I would just encourage you to intervene with that, to know that it's okay. It's okay to not want to fucking work hard every once in a while. Now, just don't give into that. Don't let that take you down into a, a wormhole of depression where you start feeling sorry for yourself and you start self-victimizing. But you can own it and be aware of it and get on the other side of it when you can. I always like to return myself to nature, uh, to something that, that is beautiful. And I don't know for you what that is. It could be getting up early and watching the sunrise. It could be taking a walk in the woods um, but I believe connecting yourself with something that is beautiful can help recharge your soul. Now, last two weeks, I dropped two of my episodes with uh, Maggie Flanagan, my mentor, master teacher, who many of you know and have studied under. And episode 12, she loved, you know, her... And uh, her husband, Richard, they, you know, just complimented me in a, in a really lovely way and, and getting that kind of feedback from certainly two people that have no problem giving me their honest opinion meant a great deal. So last week, she listens to episode 13 and she's not pleased. She's upset. She gets back in touch with me and, and she did not like the anecdote I shared about being being in first year and struggling with that scene all summer long and her throwing me out, you know, three or four times and saying to me, get the fuck out, go, you're not alive. And she was upset with me. She was like, listen, that's not an accurate portrayal. She said that it portrays me as abusive and I don't like it. Now, I would never in a million years describe Maggie as abusive. Tough, yes, but tough when she needed to be. And, you know, I, I tried to defend myself. I said, listen, that's, that's my, that was my story. That was my experience. It was my memory, and, and that's um, my, my version of it. And it actually was an incredibly important moment in my growth and my development as an actor. And she's like, well, it's not accurate. I would never have told you to get the fuck out the first time, maybe the third time. It would have built 
to get the fuck out. Okay, so let me correct the record. I don't think necessarily that uh, my version and my memory is is absolutely 100% accurate, okay? But I'll I'll use it. I I believe fully that it was an impactful experience. That being said, I don't want anybody to think that I believe that Maggie was an abusive teacher. She was tough. She was no bullshit. She was straightforward. But she was also very, very supportive and nurturing and compassionate and empathic and patient. She had a well of patience as a teacher. And certainly those qualities, all of them, her toughness, her no bullshit, her um, nurturing and supportive uh, side of her are the qualities that I have tried to instill in, in myself as a teacher and an artist. So, Maggie, I know you're listening to this. I apologize if I characterized um, you in any other way than what I believe you to be, which is one of the greatest teachers that this art form has ever produced. So, that being said, today really is about me sharing some stuff that's been piling up on my desk, some articles, some things that I've learned, some things that I, I just wanted to, to put on your radar, because I feel like that's part of my job, is to just help um, get you guys to think and expand and um, grow. I've said this before, I love reading the obituary section of the New York Times, I think it's important, uh, the Arts and Leisure section, every single day is something you should be doing. I, I discovered a new artist that I, I knew nothing about, and again, it, it just humbles me, my, the, the amount, the, the, the level of my ignorance. It's, a, it's an artist, her name is Lucita Hurtado. Lucita Hurtado, who passed away a few weeks ago at the tender age of 99. And what I found fascinating about her and why I wanted to talk about her in particular is that she did not achieve the success and the fame and the appreciation of her collective body of work until she hit her mid-90s. This is a woman who was born in Venezuela. She moves to the United States at the age of eight. Ends up spending most of her life in Los Angeles. But, you know, when she, she lived in Mexico for a little while. She was hanging around with Frida Kahlo and Diego Rivera and, and, and painting, raising a family. She was married multiple times. She had a number of children, suffered tremendous tragedy. She lost a child in her very young years as a mother. And she also lost a son later in life. You know, when you live to 99, you're going to lose some people that you're close to. And what happened was, um, a friend of hers, a friend of her uh, husband's, a, a, um, an art uh, aficionado, stumbled upon her work. Hundreds and hundreds of paintings that were just stored away. That cover, I mean, uh, many, many different styles of art. Surrealism, Mexican muralism, feminism. Her work touches on environmentalism and, and, and saving the planet. And she was rarely exhibited. Maybe in the 1970s she had one or two kind of just small local exhibitions. She was inspired by cave paintings. She was inspired by the southwestern United States and had a second home in Taos. And a lot of her art has a southwestern um, Native American um, ancestral kind of feel to it. Um, a lot of self-portraits, a lot of images of, of, of her body or of the human form kind of mixed in to the earth. She's got this, this beautiful painting. It's, it's like, you can tell like it's a body, a naked body laying on the ground, but her body is also, it looks like sand. And you see it, it almost uh, like pyramids in the distance. And out um, from the side of one of these um, pyramids is a foot. It's beautiful. It's sensual. It's, um, it's contemplative. And 
What I love about this story and this woman's life is that she created. She wasn't um, looking for fame. She wasn't looking for celebrity. She wasn't doing it for anything other than just the, 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 the joy of creating. And to find that kind of success in your 90s is unbelievable. It's extraordinary. You know, we all have this idea of what we think our, our path is going to be, right? Whether you move to New York, you move to Los Angeles, you get out of school, maybe you've, you've trained, you know, maybe you just got out of your undergrad, you got your BFA or your MFA, or you finished a program like mine. And you have this idea of what you think your career is going to be, and it doesn't work out that way. That I will promise you. It's going to go the way it goes. You know, if you would have told me at the age of, you know, 30 that I was going to be an acting teacher, I would have told you you were fucking crazy. I was an actor. It's the only thing I ever wanted to be. And really, it wasn't until I hit 35 that the whole course of my life changed and I realized my life's purpose and, you know, everything goes from there. But I would never have thought that this is what I would be doing with my life. And so when I read something like this, when I discover someone like Lucita Hurtado and her perseverance and her just commitment to the work and how that kind of, I guess, in terms of success paid off at such a, 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 a the tail end of her life, I just find it very inspiring. And I came across one quote of hers that really stuck with me, it resonated with me, and I'll share it with you. She said this, everything in this world I find I'm related to. And certainly, as an actor, as an artist, I think that's part of our job, is to try to relate to as much of the human condition as we can. To relate to the world as much as we can. To open ourselves up to the world as much as we can. And I know I've said this before, you need empathy towards human suffering, and you need intellectual curiosity to feed yourself. So please, check out her work. It's beautiful. Learn something about her and add this artist to your um, reservoir of knowledge. And when I talk about um, empathy towards human suffering, understanding what's going on in the world, I've been wanting to talk about this for a while and it just hadn't made it into the show. Do you know, I think we take for granted... I mean, we really do how lucky we are to have the freedom to say and do whatever the fuck we want. Um, a lot of people on this planet don't have that luxury and they pay a very high price for attempting to do so. And so I just wanted to mention about the death of an Egyptian filmmaker, Shady Habash. Now, this was back in May when... Shady passed away. He was a filmmaker. He was only 24 years old. And he was in Egypt, and he had the audacity to make a music video that mocked President Abdel Fattah el-Sisi. That's what he did. He mocked him in this particular video as a, a date, the fruit. Right? He was arrested. And he spent two years in an Egyptian maximum security prison. Now, <laughs> I think we can just imagine what an Egyptian maximum security prison is like. What he went through. The beatings, the torture. And he died in prison. Held in that prison for three years without a trial. Without any attempt to be able to defend himself. Just scooped up off the street and basically slow murdered for expressing himself artistically. And this is the kind of stuff that you need to be um, discovering, feeding yourself because it's an injustice. And that kind of injustice can, can bring you to life. It can give you something to call upon when you're trying to relate to something. And, you know, listen, he was not the only person that was arrested over this music video. Rami Assam who was the musician that also helped put this together. The writer of the song was also arrested and charged. And they also arrested the guy that just set up the Facebook page. I mean, they 
they will crush and squelch any kind of artistic expression. And so, you know, I just wanted you to uh, learn about Shady Habash. Watch that video and look what cost him his life. And since we are on the subject of injustice right now, there's a lot of it going on in the world. I think you need to pay attention and know what is going on in Belarus. In the last month, well over 6,000, 7,000 people have been detained. They have been arrested. They have been tortured for protesting the presidential election, which, you know, clearly has been rigged. And um, the people are upset. They're angry. And so they've been expressing themselves. And what is coming out in the news is so disturbing, so upsetting. The torture of these protesters in these Belarus prisons. You can go to uh, the Twitter account of Fernak Viacorka, and I'm just going to spell out his name, okay? You can go to the website and get the links for this episode. But Fernak Viacorka, F R A N A K, last name V I A C O R K A, his Twitter account. He was, you can watch this video, he was sitting outside of a detention center in Minsk where thousands are being kept and held. And he sat outside this detention center and he had a video camera and he recorded. And what you hear over, I don't know, four or five minutes are the screams of people being beat and being tortured. Screams in the middle of the night. It is unbelievably upsetting. It is unnerving. It is disturbing. I've personally never heard anything like that because usually we get that kind of shit in films and we know that it's not real. But when you watch his video, you can also go to the, the BuzzFeed. There's a great uh, article in BuzzFeed from, uh, I don't know, I think it's August 14th where you can drill down and, and listen to this. It It it's just another pr prime example of our inhumanity to each other. And it just starts your imagination wondering. You can close your eyes. You can listen. Because there's two, there's, there's multiple people involved here. There's the person that's being beaten and tortured. And then you've got to imagine the people that are inflicting the pain. Whether that's one person, two people, what they're using. And a lot of the young protesters that are getting out, that are being released, you know, and they're showing the bruises and the beatings on their body. It's horrific. And this is for expressing themselves. We've got to be, as artists, tuned in, piped in to this kind of injustice. Because if you are a creative, this is the fertile ground that can launch you into a project that can launch you into a poem, can launch you into a, a film, a play that you can just start to pour out of you when you start feeding yourself like this. It's really upsetting. And, you know, it makes me appreciate the fact that I can sit here and talk about that big fat orange fucking cocksucker who is slowly destroying our country and not fear repercussions or retribution, not fear being picked up off the street and thrown into a prison. And so when we see kind of the shit that goes on in Portland, where these um, unidentifiable law enforcement officers are able to just grab people off the street and throw them into unmarked vans and hold them, we need to be scared shitless about that. And as artists, as um, I think people that are, are tasked ultimately, and I think we are tasked with the responsibility of standing up and bearing witness and testifying to what we see and what we hear, we can't let that go unnoticed. Because there's not a, a, a big leap between what was happening in Portland and what is happening in Belarus. And we need to be mindful of that. 
Now, I don't want uh, this whole episode to be doom and gloom. I, I'm, not <laughs> I'm not trying to depress you. Uh, but I, I do have something else that I actually it actually might depress you. Uh, you know, the uh, Hollywood Reporter released uh, the top five highest grossing actors in America. And I'm just going to read them off to you, okay? And uh, you can uh, contemplate what this means for you personally. But at the top of the list is The Rock, Dwayne Johnson, that pro wrestler who is built like a just a marble statue. He's coming in at number one, making around twenty-three and a half million dollars a project. Then you got Ryan Reynolds, number two. The and I guess we can at least confirm the teenage bigot and racist Mark Wahlberg from Boston. Uh, is coming in at number three. You've got the unbelievably banal and boring Ben Affleck at number four. And then we're gonna round out the top five with Vin Diesel. So those are your top five highest paid actors in Hollywood. And uh, I guess for anybody that has feelings about art and about the craft, uh, I guess like me, that that won't depress you. (laughs) Um, Going in a completely different direction here. I... I don't know how Ellen DeGeneres comes out the other side of this particular um, problem that she has. And the reason why I want to bring it up, because, you know, it's been in the news, it's been talked about, right, the fact that, wow, I guess we realize that she's a bitch, or we realize that um, she's not nice, that she's mean, that this whole facade that she has put on... Um, over however many decades she's been doing her show is is really a lie. That she doesn't treat people well. Now, okay, that may or may not necessarily be fully accurate, but that's what's out there now. And she is going to have to deal with that. And I guess the reason why I'm bringing this up is because it, there were very few things that you can control in, in certainly in this business. Um, and that's this, the quality of your work, right? Which you are in complete control of and your reputation. And I think that both of those are very important. And, you know, listen, we're all going to do things. We're all going to make mistakes. We're all going to grow, hopefully, and be reflective on, you know, parts of our character that we would like to, to improve upon. But one thing you, you've got to be, certainly in this business, is just decent and nice to everybody you work with. And as an actor, if you show up on set, you show up on uh, into a, a rehearsal for theater, be nice. Be nice to everybody. Be nice to the crew. Have a, an appreciation for how hard their job is for the boom operator who's like, you know, holding this boom mic over his, his or her head for, you know, 15 hours over the course of the day the AD or the PAs that are just getting yelled at and ordered around all day, the people that are, you know, moving lights and, you know, everything that's involved in putting a piece of of art together. Be nice to people. It's a collaborative art. And people talk. And you can get a really bad reputation really quick. Now, you know, it's Ellen's show, you know, she's one on the call sheet, nothing gets done without her, so she probably uh, can get away with uh, treating people the way she wanted to, but at some point, that is going to come back to haunt you. So, if I could just give you some advice, really be nice, to be decent, be considerate, and don't get caught gossiping. It's, it's an insidious human characteristic. Of course we do it. It's how we, we learn about people. It's how we understand um, our, our, our world in a, in, a, in a micro level. But it's, an, it's, it's not good. And when you gossip, it gets back to the other person. And you want to try to just eliminate as many uncomfortable problems for yourself as a professional so just take that for what it's worth 
And now let me move on to something that just, I don't know, it, it made me laugh and it made me appreciate the importance of ideas. And, you know, I'm always talking to my students. I know I've mentioned it here on this show that if you're going to be really good as an artist, if you're going to be a good actor, you have to have ideas. You have to have them they, and you have to have them the courage to, to do something with it to actually implement the idea. And I think that's really what separates the successful creator from, from the non-successful, right? Because we all have ideas. How many of you have been sitting around going, oh, I've got this great idea. I've got this idea for a book. I've got this idea for a play. I've got this idea for a script. I've got this idea for a show. And you don't do anything about it. The successful people who have ideas actually do something with them. And there's this new book that's out. It's It's actually um, uh, been written about here. It's quite popular now. It's called Men to Avoid in Art and Life by the Detroit-based writer Nicole Tursini. T-R-S-I-G-N-I. Nicole Tursini. And basically what this is is a book where she has taken 18th, 17th century art and she has captioned it in a way that catches... Um, the stupidity of men and the misogyny that women have been subjected to. And this idea of her sprouted from the fact that she was, you know, scrolling through Twitter one day and she saw this guy explaining to a woman her own joke back to her. And she could relate to this. She said, you know, that this had happened to her many times in life. And I'm sure there, every woman that's listening to this can appreciate this. So... She Googles women surrounded by men. Because sometimes that's what women feel like, she said, when you're online. And so she stumbles upon this 17th century oil painting. And in this painting, it's a, it's a, it's a painting of a woman who's bearing one of her breasts in the middle of uh, just kind of this, this group, this scrum of bald men. So she took that painting and she put a caption to it. And the caption was this, Maybe if I take my tit out, they will stop explaining my own joke back to me. And then that led to another picture. And it led to another picture. And what came out of this is a book where she has taken 16th, 17th, 18th century painting and she has captioned it. And what I also love, and this is why I'm sharing this with you, because it made me think about character, about um, ideas for um, approaching a part, if it calls on it. She divides men up into categories. The first one is called the mansplainer. And that's the, the guy who has to explain things in a condescending way because you as a woman are too stupid to understand what I'm talking about. I think everybody has heard about that, the mansplainer. The other one that she talks about it is called the concern troll. <laughs> now, the concern troll approaches a woman with a sense of worry, a sense of concern because there's something going on with you, but it's not really sincere. And then we have the comedian. The comedian now is the unfunny person who is convinced of his funniness. And if you don't laugh, or if you don't find what he's saying funny, then of course, then he goes into the man explainer and has to explain the joke because you don't get it, because clearly it's funny. And then we have the sexpert. Now, the sexpert is that heterosexual guy who thinks he has all the answers to sex and knows the woman's body better than she does. That's the sexpert. I'm sure many of you have met him. <laughs> and then we have the patronizer. And I, I certainly, when I read this, I thought, oh, yeah, that feels, that feels close to home. And the patronizer, he patronizes women by harping on their feelings. Oh, well, listen, I can't, I can't talk to you if you're going to act hysterical. I can't, I can't talk to you if you're going to be so emotional. You know, you need to calm down. And I just thought, well, you know, if you're approaching a part, you know, any one of those things, the mansplainer, the concern troll, the comedian, the sexpert, the patronizer can give you kind of a way to launch off into something. So check out the book. And, you know, now I want to talk about 
someone who is impressed the hell out of me. Her story is incredible, and she's doing amazing work, uh, groundbreaking work, really, if you ask me, and that's Michaela Cole. Now, Michaela Cole is the star, the writer, the producer uh, of what I think is one of the best shows on television right now, and that's HBO's I May Destroy You. And before I talk about just the show itself and, and what it's meant to me over the first, you know, six, seven episodes that I've watched so far, is the guts and the belief in herself that Michaela exhibited. You know, she was offered, and you can read this, it's a great Vulture article about uh, Michaela. She was offered a million dollars by Netflix for I May Destroy You. But they weren't going to give her any creative control. They were going to take complete ownership of it. She didn't have any copyright uh, percentage. She had nothing, but they were going to give her a million dollars. And she tried. She tried to negotiate with them. She tried to get 5%. She tried to get 2.5%. She tried to get 2%. And they said, no, we don't do that. And then she found out that CAA, now CAA was her agent. And CAA, I mean, you know, you're with CAA. You can't really get much higher than that. One of the biggest, most uh, powerful agencies in this business. And found out that CAA, her agents, were going to get a nice little, you know, kickback on the back end if they made this Netflix deal. And so CAA had been pushing her to sign the deal. It's a million dollars. Take it. And she said, fuck you. She fired CAA and she took her show and now she's ended up on BBC One and HBO and she's got full, complete creative control. She's executive producer and it's just a testament to when an artist knows and believes that they have something of value, that they value their own work and that it's not about the money. And, you know, it is an incredible show. It's about a woman who was out partying with friends and realizes the next day that she was roofied and raped and the whole show is the unfolding of this realization and piecing it all together so it's it's disturbing on that front but she's also pushing boundaries in a way that i have personally not seen on television with um homosexuality with uh, sex as it's portrayed on television there's a, a very just uh, and this is the white guy in me, right? So this also is just getting tapped into my, my, my unconscious racism and my bias. But there is a scene where three black men are coming together to fuck. And two of them are really into it. One, one of the guys really is, and he ends up checking out. But you see in, a, in very raw, very vulnerable um, way these two gay men fucking each other. And I, I've, I've never seen something like that um, on television. Certainly not two black men, and certainly not in the way it was portrayed. And, you know, my white, just middle-aged sensibility, I was, it was, it, I was uncomfortable watching it. And I, just, I was able to step out of myself and say, wow, you're really uncomfortable here. This is really challenging you to be open and to, um, and to take in. And I was just incredibly impressed with the actors because that was not an easy scene to shoot. The material is exceptionally well done. It's well written. It's a great show. You have to put this on the top of your list. I May Destroy You. And you need to know and you need to follow Michaela Cole. You need to read about her. You need to learn about what she's doing. And you need to champion not just her, but other artists like her. And hopefully you can find some inspiration from her story. Now, I'm ready to wrap up the show, but I thought I would end today with a quote. And this is a quote from Elizabeth Gilbert, her lovely book, her incredible, insightful, and uh, Honest book, Big Magic. And I've said many times that I think you need to disabuse yourself if you hold on to this cliche of being a suffering artist. I don't think it's helpful. 
but it's romanticized in our culture. And I'm going to read a little bit from this book and what Elizabeth Gilbert has to say. In contemporary Western civilization, the most common creative contract still seems to be one of suffering. This is the contract that says, I shall destroy myself and everyone around me in an effort to bring forth my inspiration, and my martyrdom shall be the badge of my creative legitimacy. The Tormented Artist You will find no shortage of role models. To honor their example, follow these fundamental rules. Drink as much as you possibly can. Sabotage all of your relationships. Wrestle so vehemently against yourself that you come up bloodied every time. Express constant dissatisfaction with your work. Jealously compete against your peers. Begrudge anybody else's victories. Proclaim yourself cursed, not blessed, by your talents. Attach your sense of self-worth to external rewards. Be arrogant when you are successful and self-pitying when you fail. Honor darkness above light. Die young. Blame creativity for having killed you. End quote. Well, my fellow daydreamers, thank you for sticking around, keeping that phone in your pocket, in your purse, in your fanny pack. Follow the show. Subscribe to it. Leave it a review, particularly on iTunes. It would help a great deal. You can go to my website, creatingbehaviorpodcast.com. You can leave me a message. I use SpeakPipe. All you got to do is press a button. You can follow Creating Behavior on Instagram at Creating Behavior. You can follow the Maggie Flanagan Studio at Maggie Flanagan Studio. Lawrence Trailer, thank you for the music as always. Well, my friends, it's August. It's a long month. You can be lazy, that's all right. But at some point, get your ass up off the fucking couch. Play full out with yourself, and don't ever settle for your second best. My name is Charlie Sandlin. Peace. <laughs>